Welcome to this week's episode of Locally Grown, where we grill and groove here in the garden. Broadcasting live from the yard and today, I'm so pleased to have Dom Flemons, two-time Grammy Award winner Dom Flemons, here in the yard. And how are you, Dom? Oh, I'm doing well. I'm doing all right. You know, Chip, it's been a, just a, a real pleasure to get a chance to grill and, and chat it up with you a little bit. We have a special interviewer here today, doc, cultural historian Dr. Jocelyn Yamani, who's going to be talking with Dom about his work that he's been doing. And I'm going to turn it over to her in just a minute. And we're, then we're going to listen to some music. We're going to learn some history today here in the yard and on Locally Grown. Hi, Dom. Hey, how's it going? I'm good. It's good. I'm glad to be here with you. Yeah, it's a real pleasure. So, there's a lot in this magical bag of yours, but let's start with um, this instrument. Well, first, can you tell us a little bit about how you got started, and then can you end that story with an explanation of this instrument here? Oh, yeah. Well, that's actually a perfect segue. I'll tell you that. You know, uh, when I first started, I'm originally from Phoenix, Arizona. And I guess uh, I started out playing drums in school, just like in the school band, and I played in the marching band, the four bass drum line. And I guess when I was about 16, right when I was around a, a junior in high school, I got interested in, in poetry, uh, particularly the beat poets, uh, Lawrence Berlinghetti and uh, uh, William S. Burroughs and Allen Ginsberg, people like that, Jack Kerouac. And then I got interested in Bob Dylan's music around the same time because they kind of had a, a, an overlapping scene in the 50s and right. 60s of folk music, bebop jazz, and beat poetry all at the same time. Mm -hmm. So um, being someone who was born in 1982 and came up in the 90s, it, the 90s was an interesting time, especially toward the middle part of the decade, because it was a time when they were reissuing all the classic recordings of all right. these different musicians. Right. So it wasn't just picking up an album, but understanding there was historical relevance and cultural relevance mm -hmm. to it at the same time so that allowed me to jump ahead in terms of my personal scholarship on music in a way that I think was unique for the time so that's how it started out uh, when I heard Bob Dylan's music I really wanted to start playing guitar um, and I started learning the different songs because they were kind of uh, literary based and from there I started picking up records because this is before um, uh, anyone be uh, on DJs or was listening to vinyl records. So uh, some of the older people were unloading their collections in the old junk shops, and I was just grabbing any records, you know, and that'd be like Sam Cooke. It'd be like um, for a while I got into doo wop, so I got into all the records of all the people you hear on greatest hits, you know, from the Spaniels to the Robins to the right. Moon Glows and whatnot. So wow. I learned all these different songs. Chuck Berry was an yeah. influence, Fats Domino, Carl Perkins, uh, Jerry Lee Lewis. And that got me into, you know, uh, Ike Turner's early music, you know, mm -hmm. before it was the Ike and Tina review. Right. Ike Turner was a very prominent pioneer of rock and roll. Sun Records is, of course, a, a big, a big uh, company. Uh, Chess Records, all that different stuff. And uh, also Mercury, Hank Williams, mm -hmm. Ray Price and all that. So I had a really multifaceted sort of uh, want to listen to a lot of different types of music. My parents were encouraging about listening to a lot of music. They didn't really ever play music per se, but when I got into guitar, they kind of scratched their heads and said, well, that's what he wants to do. So I just went from there. Um, I guess a, about three or four years after I was playing guitar, I came across a tenor banjo, a four-string banjo in a junk shop uh, in Phoenix. Oddly enough, it was the place where Dwayne Eddy got his first guitar. I found out way later but it's a little shop called Ziggy's that doubles as a uh, mariachi, so they sold guitarones and bajo sextos right. as well as guitars and banjos and right. things like that. And um, so I got a banjo and I loved the sound of bluegrass and Dixieland jazz. And then as I went along, I then found out that it was an African-American instrument. And so at first it was just a thing that floated around in the background. But in 2005, I was approached by a fellow named Sule Greg Wilson who um, is a, a, a scholar, a African drummer, and, and a banjo player as well. And he got me hip to an event that was getting ready to happen called the Black Banjo Gathering. It was in Boone, North Carolina. And that was where I first was made aware that 
this history of the banjo is far deeper than the, um, I guess, than the... That was uh, overall. I mean, it was. I'd say about 400 people all together came to the wow, gathering, wow, but it wow, was, wow, wow, okay. but it was only about a dozen black banjo players. A lot of it were were scholars who had uh, spent a lot of their lives focusing on different parts of the music. One scholar in particular, Mike Seeger, who's from around uh, Silver Spring, originally brother of uh, the very famous uh, Pete Seeger, also a. Mike was a, a prominent musician in his own right with the New Lost City Ramblers and uh, the many people he recorded and, and made a lot of great recordings as well. This banjo here actually is uh, connected to Mike in a way because this was created by a banjo uh, maker by the name of Bob Thornburg who made Mike a gourd banjo many years ago. And so Bob uh, gifted this to me. And this one's a symbolic uh, banjo because on the back of it, I have featured here, he made a little family tree for my family, so that's me, my wife Vania, and then our baby Cheyenne Love. And so these are Sankofa birds, and Sankofa birds, uh, the Sankofa is a proverb from the Ashanti people from the Gold Coast of Africa, which means go back and fetch it, and take the things that you want that are relevant from the past and bring that to the present, to the future depicted by a bird flying forward but reaching its beak backward onto its back wing to show that it's taking the lesson from the past. And so once I learned about that at the Black Banjo Gathering, mm -hmm. I then used that as a way to continue my studies into older music. Because of course at first people say, why do you like that old stuff? Why are, you, why are you doing that? And I couldn't give them an answer. So once I heard about Sankofa, that was the answer. I'm doing, I, even though I'm not doing the 50 to 100 generations that the griots do in Africa, mm -hmm. I'm doing my own Americanized version of it with right. just 10 generations, you know, right. and, and going off of that. Because there's so much amazing American culture and African American culture that still needs to be talked about, reanalyzed, sure. and used for, for future generations to know that we come from somewhere. You know, it's not just a African that we're moving over into America sort of thing, or that slavery even though it was a inhumane practice, there was there was culture that was built from that resistance and from that desire to uplift the race that's still just as important mm -hmm. as anything else. And so for me it's that's driven me to continue moving forward. So with that, I know you're gonna do some songs for us today. Mm -hmm. Um and, and that, that there's some there's some pieces of culture, uh some some piece of storytelling that I hope we get some time to get into, but let's get into a song. Okay. So what's the first song you're going to do for us? Well, with this Gord Banjo, I'm going to play a song I learned from right. Joe Thompson, who was another okay. musician I met at the Black Banjo Gathering. Okay. He was an African-American fiddler. He was mm -hmm. 85 when I met him from Mebane, North Carolina. He, he grew up playing square dance music in his community in, in the Triangle. And um, in the Triangle of North Carolina, there's Piedmont blues, that's the mm -hmm. more prominent uh, style of music, but the, the fiddle and banjo music from the Piedmont. Uh, that's Fed, folks. That's right? exactly. Okay. So she's from the Eastern Piedmont, mm -hmm. but same type of thing. The the uh, finger picking style was born out of this fiddle and banjo music that came from a little bit earlier. So Joe retained a lot of those old mm -hmm. traditions, and so I had the, the great fortune of working with him a long time. He's actually part of the reason I moved to North Carolina for and I lived there for about 10 years. And then I started a group with another woman, uh, uh, Rena and Giddens, who I met at the gathering, and we started a group of Carolina Chocolate Drops, presenting Joe Thompson's music. Mm -hmm. And then eventually we expanded beyond that into a multi, multi, multi-faceted folk music tradition presentation. But but Joe's music was always the core. So this is a song called Old Corn Liquor. Okay. And this is a square dance number. So I'll do a little bit of the square dance calls as Joe used to do them on the gourd banjo. Old Corn Liquor. Right by right. 
This one is a plectrum banjo. So the gourd banjo, this is one that's sort of a replica of what people were playing when it was still a homemade instrument. Mm. Of course, okay. over several hundred years, you had uh, you had African Americans were playing them for about a hundred years of it. Even Thomas Jefferson references that the banjo mm. came over from Africa. Mm. And then after that, the blackface minstrel show of the mid 19th century, it incorporated the banjo into itself. So it was an international phenomenon from there. So it then became an instrument that was factory made. So then they started using metal parts on it. And I noticed with this one, it looks like a snare drum. Can you hold it sideways a little bit for the audience? Oh, sure. So see, because the top, it looks like a snare drum on top of a, a guitar. Well, that's something that, I, that drew me into the banjo initially was since I started out playing drums, that the snare drum like quality, I could do rudiments, I could do. You know, do right. snare drum rolls and yeah. do those rudiments, but make Do a chords. drum roll right quick. Oh wow! Okay. You know, so and that that led me to Dixieland jazz, where they they do that. You know, like a song like when the Saints go marching. You go. So what are you gonna play now? I'll play a little number um, called "Your Baby Ain't Sweet Like Mine." This is one. Right. This is one I used to do years ago, and I still play this one on a lot of occasions. This is from Papa Charlie Jackson, who was from New Orleans. And he was the first popular male blues singer to make records. Wow. And so this is a little, just a funny little ragtime number. Your baby ain't sweet like mine. And you'll notice, instead of five strings like the gourd banjo, this one has four. That's mm -hmm. why it's a plectrum. It's, it became very popular uh, through the jazz age. And they just used four strings instead of having a drone, which is said to be one of the more African-type traits of this instrument, is having a, mm -hmm. a drone string going. Mm -hmm. So let me play a little bit of this one, some of this ragtime. <laughs> Your baby ain't sweet like mine, oh yes Your baby ain't sweet like mine 
So you recently relocated from North Carolina, uh, and you came for a particular reason. Is, is this it? Tell us about this project. So, uh, Black Cowboys started out when I was uh, driving back to visit family over in Phoenix, Arizona. So I was um, I was driving on I-40, and I was going back, uh, going back via Flagstaff, which is where my father's from, and. I stopped off over by the Petrified Forest and I found a book called The Negro Cowboys, which was printed in the mid-1960s. And the basic premise around that was two school teachers that saw that at least one-fourth of the cowboys who settled the West were African-American cowboys. And so I found that to be intriguing just like they did. And as I read the book, I realized that there was a very deep history of black Western culture, also being originally from Phoenix, Arizona. I'm aware of an African American community in the Southwest because I'm part of that community. And, but I, I know that on the mainstream level of Arizona, it's not really thought of as a, a community with a, a strong African American community. And then even California, which has a large African American community, people don't tend to think about that stuff in terms of cowboys and Western culture when it comes to the mainstream uh, depiction of cowboys. So what are you going to play next for us? Adam, what, what, what are you going to play from this record? Well, I wanted to, because there was so much information, I decided to make it like Black Cowboys 101 and made it the first comprehensive Black Cowboys folk record. Mm -hmm. And one of the songs, uh, I want to just highlight certain individuals that were dynamic. And so this one's about a fellow named Bass Reeves, who was the first Deputy U.S. Marshal of the United States who was African American, west of the Mississippi. First one was Frederick Douglass. Yes. But, um, west of the Mississippi. West though. of the Mississippi. First All one right. west of the Mississippi. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so uh, with Bass Reeves, he had an interesting story in the way that he was born into slavery in Arkansas and he had a particular encounter with his master after a while where the master invited him to play poker. Mm -hmm. He won all of the master's money and at the last minute, the master decided to put he and Bass's mother's freedom up as collateral on the card game. Bass then found out that the master started cheating on the next round. So then he just leaned over and knocked him out. And then he decided that that wasn't the best thing for him to have done, so he jumped on a horse and lived with the Cherokee Nation for about a decade. Years later, uh, the, the hanging judge, Isaac Parker, was looking for different deputy marshals to go into the Indian Territory and bring people to justice. And Bass Reeves, because he had a knowledge of the territory, as well as the languages and the practices of the Cherokee Nation, he was uh, brought in as a, um, a deputy U.S. marshal. And then the topper of all of it, He's said to be the inspiration for the fictional character, the Lone Ranger, because he traveled alone and did a lot of the same things the Lone Ranger did, using disguises and going after bounties and whatnot. So, I'm taking my cues from the great Lightning Hopkins from Centerville, Texas, and that was another thing was bringing Texas blues and some of the cowboy type blues that is out there already into the, the framework of black cowboys with a key. So here's a little bit of he's a Lone Ranger. Now he's a U.S. Marshal and a Lone Ranger. He's a U.S. Marshal and a Lone Ranger. He's a Lone Ranger. Bass Reeves is his name. There was a man uh, way out west, go around this country with a stone on his breast. Every white man in an Indian tribe knew he was the baddest man that ever was alive. He's a U.S. Marshal and a Lone Ranger. He is a Lone Ranger. Bass Reeves is his name. Broad shouldered and six feet tall. Rode a soul that could outrun them all. Master of a pistol, a master of disguise. He looked every man he caught now dead in the eyes. Cause he's a U.S. Marshal and a Lone Ranger. He is a Lone Ranger. Bass Reeves is his name. Born a slave down in Arkansas. Lived with his master and his dear old ma. Mama said, son, you ain't free, but you can do anything you want, though, if the mister don't see. Now he's a U.S. Marshal and a Lone Ranger. He 
is a long ranger, Bass Reeves is his name. NASA called Bass Reeves to a gambling game. Bass's freedom was the stake that he made. Now Massa cheated, you ought to heard the sound of Bass's hoof beats as Massa hit the ground. Now he's a U.S. Marshal and a Lone Ranger. He is a Lone Ranger. Bass Reeves is his name. Bass Reeves breaking the song, getting down to business and it won't be long. Now we're in Muskoka, a hundred miles around. They call him Bass Reeves, he's bound to track you down. Cause he's a U.S. Marshal and a Lone Ranger. He is a Lone Ranger. Bass Reeves is his name. So I'm excited about one of the tracks because you tie a lot of things together and one of my personal favorite historical characters, Matt Love. Can you, I, I know it's a lot to get into, but can you <laughs> briefly give us a, a overshot of, a, like an overshadow view of this next song? Sure thing. Well, I mentioned the book, The Negro Cowboys. On the cover, Nat Love is featured on the front. So uh, when you see a picture of him in his cowboy gear, he's a stunning, uh, figure to just see it image wise and in terms of black cowboys it's pretty instant that that you can see what the deal with black cowboys might be it's about to rain uh -oh. for real the sky trying look at the tears rolling down the street so we got rained in and we were about to uh, have an experience with track 12 off of Don Simmons, Simmons Presents Black Cowboys. It's called Still Pony, Still Pony Blues, so take it away. All right. Get down to Holbrook, you won't find me there. Good Lord, I caught the first thing smoking down the road somewhere. Caught the first thing smoking down the road somewhere. Cause I caught my steel pony and boys, I'm gonna ride. Getting far too old to follow this year herd. Good Lord, I caught the first thing smoking down the road somewhere. Caught the first thing smoking. Down the road somewhere Till I caught my steel pony and boys I'm gonna ride Now they call me Mr. Flemings Cause I'm a poor porter now Good Lord, I caught the first thing smoking Down the road somewhere Caught the first thing smoking Down the road somewhere Cause I caught my steel pony and boys I'm going to ride Go ahead and get six
they call me Mr. Flemings. Cause I done told that guitar down. Good Lord, I caught the first thing smoking down the road somewhere. And now, when you get over there, you won't find me. Cause I caught them a steel pony, and boys, I'm going to ride here. Unfortunately, we only have time for one more song. So uh, you're going to do track 15, Goodbye Old Paint. Tell us a little bit about that song and then lead us into it. Well, in the course of doing this record, I, uh, I wanted to have some of the old time cowboy numbers that were associated with the black cowboys. One of them uh, was Home on the Range, which mm -hmm. John Lomax recorded from a black uh, cook on the range in San Antonio in 1908, recorded on a cylinder, transcribed it into sheet music and now it's mm. the well-known song home on the range we all know so to even to the to know that there's a african-american root with some of these old-time songs is uh, is really a revelation of itself the other half of that was uh, this song here goodbye old paint which is another one that was recorded by john lomax but he recorded a, a white fiddler by the name of jess morris and uh, Jess Morris told the story of how he learned it from an ex-slave who worked for his father on the ranch. And then that he learned fiddle from another black cowboy. Mm. And they put together an arrangement of this song, Goodbye Old Paint. And this song kind of structurally is somewhere between like a, a, a English or a UK or Anglo-American ballad and, and what we would now consider blues. Mm. And so putting that into consideration, I tried to figure out from the original field recording, what could I what could I add that would give it a slight blues inflection um, to show maybe how Charlie Willis might have sung it. And so this is a, a really beautiful narrative ballad. So the goodbye old paint. Old paints and old pony and 
she paces when she can. She was riding old paint and leading old ball. Old paint, old paint, I'm leaving shine. Goodbye, old paint, I am leaving shine. Cause old paint's an old pony and she paces when she can. So he named her Cheyenne Old paint, old paint I'm a-leaving Cheyenne Goodbye, old paint I am leaving Cheyenne Cause old paint's an old pony And she paces when she can Smithsonian Folkways, their website, folkways.si.edu. That would be the best way. It's also available on all the major outlets. Um, you can also visit my website, theamericansongster.com, to find out all things Dom Flemings and all the, the different adventures I've had. I mean, I've in uh, the past several years, I've had the great fortune of being able to be a part of the opening ceremonies of, at the National Museum of African American History and Culture, which I heard we, that's a wonderful you know, place. It is a very <laughs> wonderful place. This album is actually part of a series, the African American Legacy Recording Series that Smithsonian's done, and this series was meant to actually lead the way so people knew the museum was going to be built, and mm. so uh, that's how I first heard about the series, and when I saw that there wasn't a, a comprehensive black cowboy folk record that had ever been in existence before I decided to try to remedy that and of course the African American Legacy series was the first place I went to and uh, in conjunction with Smithsonian Folkways I got to uh, make this uh, album which uh, I hope would be a, an excellent historical document because I feel like the period between mm. emancipation and the modern era of African American culture I feel like that gets underrepresented and Black Cowboys really tells the story of folks that said they didn't want to do the sharecropping and they wanted to find something new. And they made a lot of amazing achievements in doing that despite the, despite the odds. But also in Western culture there's a different way that segregation and racism worked. And mm -hmm. so you find also exceptions to the rule compared to the 
the sort of the mainstream idea we have seen everybody is completely separate. You know, in the West, everything's so spread apart right. that when neighbors are there together, or if you were part of the communities that settled the place, then you had slightly different dynamics that went on. And so that's something that's more of a unspoken rules that uh, ended up making their way in. But there's a lot of different stuff in there like that uh, that I think people would find appealing. Well, thank you so much for uh, being willing to reach back and get it. San Kofa. Yeah. All right. <laughs> ashe, ashe. <laughs> well, that was a wonderful episode of Locally Grown. Even if we got rained out, we were able to rain it in, come in here to the living room. I see what you did there. I see what I did there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We learned a lot today. We learned about history. We learned about uh, uh, African American history. We learned about the roots of what we consider to be American music. Uh, got to work with Dom Flemons and my hero in history, Dr. Jocelyn Imani. Thanks Thank you for coming out here on short notice and, uh, and, and hosting this show. Thank it was, you. you were the right host to have. <laughs> All right, everybody, tune in each week where we grill and groove in the garden on Locally Grown. Locally Grown.